Kira Koto, Noringarangi Aho, Itipu Akeo Ki Nailsworth, Kei Fangapara, Aho Noha Ana, No Turanga Nui Akiwa Tokohua Tane, Ko Nati Pro Tona Iwi, Kei Te Mana Tatai Hokohoko Aho E Mahi Ana, Ko Claire Toko Ingoa. Kira Koto, many thanks for inviting me to speak today. I've met many of you before as the Director of Banking and Insurance, uh, but this is the first time I'm speaking to you with a focus on my new role as the Executive Director of Regulatory Delivery. We've brought together the work we do with our various, various licensed or soon to be licensed populations into this new team so that we can develop a consistent and relationship-based approach to supervision across all sectors. What I've heard from you is that consistency is one of the things that you value and want to see more of from us while at the same time being able to appreciate and adapt to the important differences in business models and services. There's been plenty of work going on, as you've heard, getting ready for our expanded remits and building on the mahi done so far. We will need to deepen our understanding of your business, not just so that we can highlight risks, but also opportunities to influence better outcomes for New Zealanders. We will listen and engage in problem solving, exploring the challenges to achieving good outcomes and be flexible to different methods. And we will be clear and transparent in our communications so that you aren't in any doubt about what our view is. But as Samantha said, the changes will not happen overnight and we'll be evaluating what works well and what needs adjustment as we go, including by listening to your feedback. The three new regulatory regimes comprising the conduct of financial institutions, financial advice and climate related disclosures are significant steps forward for both us and for you. The new financial advice regime is a clear example of where industry and the regulator have worked together with a joint goal of smooth implementation. And to that point, again, I want to thank the FSC for all the work it's done in this area, alongside other industry bodies to ensure our collective goals were achieved. We want to see New Zealanders becoming more confident about their financial futures and well-being, more confident about accessing financial advice and being able to trust that their advisor is working in their best interests. We all have a role to play in helping to promote the value of advice in making well-informed decisions about the products that are most suitable. As the 17th of March quickly approaches, the date when you must either hold a financial, advi uh, financial advice provider full licence or operate under someone else's, around 1,900 firms are now operating under that full licence. It also signals the end of the two-year competency safe harbour, while all advisors and nominated representatives must be fully competent under the Code of Professional Conduct for Financial Advice Services. On climate-related disclosures, we're working closely with other agencies, namely the XRB and the company's office, to ensure that there is a smooth start to the regime. Over the coming weeks, we will be giving you an outline of what you can expect and when and how we can support entities that qualify. So for Kofi, I'd like to highlight a few key milestones. Our intermediated distribution draft guidance will be published next month. I know there's a lot of interest here, and again, I'd like to thank the FSC and other industry bodies for the role they have played in getting people around the table in a series of constructive workshops held last year. These open and honest conversations were a critical element to what I hope is getting guidance that will work for everyone. Kofi licensing will open in July and we're currently in the process of planning more events that will focus on assisting institutions through the application process. When I spoke at the FSC conference last year, I talked about how Kofi is a move away from that box ticking compliance towards this deliberate focus on outcomes, including proactive analysis of how products are actually performing for customers and not just the business. It's a message that you are going to hear from us consistently, from me, from Samantha, from the FMA as a whole. Kofi puts the onus on institutions to consider what fairness looks like and then formalize that in the Fair Conduct Programme a programme where everyone in the institution can understand their role in treating customers fairly. As I've said before, you know your business best, and that's why you are the best people to design, implement, and own your fair conduct programme, and this will look and feel different for different institutions. You'll need to put yourself in the customer's shoes and be honest with yourself about what their experience was and is really like. 
I'd just like to finish with reiterating what we expect during the cur current economically challenging environment. Customers, some of whom will never have experienced anything like the current conditions, will be stretched and feeling pressures that they're unfamiliar with. They will be vulnerable. It's precisely at times like this that we expect firms to support their customers with clear communications, as well as plans and processes for navigating and ultimately successfully managing their problems and stress points during a difficult period. I'll now hand over to Paul, who's going to speak before we take questions. Kira Koto. Katangi te titi, katangi te kaka, katangi hoki koaho, te hei mauri ora. Ko Paul Gregory taku ingoa. He kai whakahaere te mana tātai hoko hoko, taku tāre. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Morena, uh, thank you Claire, thank you Sam. I'd like to develop a little further uh, what Sam has said about how enforcement and regulatory responses in general fit in with being outcomes focused. As part of that, I'll talk about what's not changing uh, and what will be different about our response and enforcement approach. First, what doesn't change is enforcement and other regulatory tools are part and parcel of an outcomes focused. Uh, holding firms and individuals account for what they do and how they do it deters misconduct, clarifies the law, supports investor and consumer confidence in markets, in services, in products and in firms, prompts improvement and, and, and investment in systems, process and capability, and helps level the playing field between those playing fair and those playing the whistle. These are outcomes. Uh, we know industry gets this. In particular, the level playing field aspect of outcomes, not least because it explicitly underpins most of the complaints that we get from you about your competitors. And what we understand uh, is a demonstrable will and ability to respond with regulatory tools is what we as a regulator fundamentally bring to the table. It's why industry pays attention to us in the venues like this and individually. Regulatory response is the or what of good conduct. The stick, its shadow and the sights and sounds of it being applied as an object lesson elsewhere, uh, these are the key ingredients of credible deterrence. The second thing which won't change is the other key ingredient of credible deterrence, balance, proportion, precision, timeliness. We're clear it can't always be hammer time. Being jammed at the hard end of the regulatory pendulum risks consistently imposing unnecessary delay, burden and cost, undermining trust and confidence in the FMA and ultimately our ability to do our job. So we will continue to ask ourselves, how well does our selected response address the issue, including what is the actual potential harm? Is this a sector that is used to regulation or is it new? What is the track record and attitude to good conduct of the entity? Is public interest a relevant consideration? Is market confidence an issue? Sometimes, even often, uh, a response is a well-placed conversation. Influence is an effective, um, versatile regulatory tool when used well. But stop it or I'll tell you to stop it again is not an effective and by definition not a sustainable regulatory approach. So adept targeting of regulatory tools will sometimes also require doing something stronger uh, than the market expects. Not from lack of imagination or from zealotry, but from a judgment that the harm that we have seen requires and merits a response the whole market can see and hear clearly. So what's going to change? Sam and, and Claire have talk, talked about it. Our new structure is, is designed to ensure we identify and assess risks and then intervene or choose not to more effectively and efficiently where consumers, investors, our markets and our financial system get the most bang for buck. In my area, or what's going to be my area, this also means thinking more broadly about success and what that looks like, including at the pointiest end of the stick, enforcement. Most observers and media and elsewhere have a quite binary view, it's win or lose. We intend to evolve this mindset. We will still be thorough, we will still be rigorous, but we will also be prepared to be challenged on a regulatory action if the outcomes either that we win or we and others learn or otherwise benefit. Because even if we don't win, a case can help identify, uh, sorry, clarify the law, provide certainty for the market and consumers, 
the issue in its discussion can have ripple effect benefits, changes in consumer expectations and behaviour, changes in industry practice, changes in public dialogue about how things should be done. There is also value to industry and to fellow regulators and consumers and investors from what we do, for example, education, guidance, public engagement, after we have got an enforcement decision. Finally, it's worth taking a step back to acknowledge the FMA exists to change behaviour, backed by the laws which are our best available proxy for what New Zealanders need and want. Which means, as, as Malcolm Sparrow says, that even when we do our job well, perhaps especially if we have reinforced our credible deterrent well, not everyone will say thank you. Our role inevitably involves tension with industry, because to achieve the purpose we have been given and the vision we have chosen, we impose on private firms, mostly on their latitude to pursue short-term economic interests. But sometimes the imposition is, and sometimes it must be, more limiting and more serious. After all, if any regulatory intervention, if, sorry, if any regulatory matter does not involve tension with industry to satisfactory resolve, it probably didn't require regulation in the first place. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Claire, and hey, congratulations on your respective roles. Um, so let's get straight into it. Something sort of practical to start off with. Um, Claire, you've told us what your regulatory delivery role will focus on, and Paul, you've told us about where enforcement fits in an outcome-focused environment. But can you tell us about how the two of you and your teams will work together? Sure, shall I, shall I mm -hmm. kick it off? So, um, so Paul's team and my team are going to be working very closely together, particularly um, as Paul has uh, parts of supervision within his unit, so our specialist areas, um, uh, AML, for example, and CFT, but also um, our supervision response area, which is focused on those complex cases uh, that need that extra resource to work through. So our areas are going to be working incredibly closely together because we need our subject matter experts right across the organisation to be able to focus in on those those outcomes that matter and work together. So I think it's almost like, um, although Paul has also got his enforcement um, angle as well, it's almost like we're, we're effectively co-heads of the supervision unit. Yes, and, and what Claire said uh, about uh, being consistent, um, that will be critical um, to how we work together as well. That will, be, uh, that will be the output from being on the receiving end of supervision uh, and regulatory tools or, or enforcement is that it's consistent. Thank you. And thinking about the MIS value for money piece of work, and you know now I, the rubber's really hitting the road on that, um, how will the handover of that work? Um, so, in terms of um, caring about uh, the, the value uh, and, the, and the importance of, of good investment management, um, it won't. Uh, I'll continue to do that. Uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, of the, the MIS sector, whether it's KiwiSaver uh, or, it's, or it's managed fund outside of KiwiSaver, that, that's very much shared. So, obviously, there's a supervisory aspect to that, an ongoing supervisory, an important one, uh, and Claire, uh, Claire's area includes um, investment managers and it includes um, supervisors as well, and they're critical to this. Uh, but Obviously, it's mature, so the, um, the, the KiwiSaver um, expectations for reasonable fees is mature, um, members' interests is mature, uh, and so, uh, as you say, uh, the, the rubber is about to hit to the road. We are about to start seeing the reports, and as we've said right from the start, um, that if there are disputed outcomes, if there's a reluctance to engage, um, then we're happy to have a different conversation, which will be in my area. Thank you. Uh, so a question here, will the FMA have the appetite to take difficult cases you may lose in order to clarify those points of law? Yes. <laughs> Good short yeah. answer there. Yeah. <laughs> um, the CRD regime, it's already in force for some in the room, but there is a sense it's a lower priority than Kofi. Is that right? Uh, absolutely not. We see all of our three um, key regimes that are going through the implementation of, of, of equal importance. And I think it really, uh, to my mind, um, 
brings to bear on the importance of this sector actually to New Zealanders um, and even on the global stage. I mean, uh, the, the CRD regime, we are really very much at the forefront uh, of what's happening across, um, across the globe on this topic. Um, and so it's absolutely crucial for us. But it also um, shows the value of working with partners as well. As I said, the XRB, uh, we're working very closely with, as well as the company's office, um, together with the rest of the industry. We're all learning as we go uh, with this. So it's, it's, um, it's absolutely a critical priority for us. But Paul, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, I think it's not lesser a priority, it's just that we understand that there are very good reasons to take a different approach, at least initially with CRD, because it is new, because there are questions around data, because there are questions around the standards in terms of how they align with international standards when they come. So I think it's just a different approach because of different underpinnings to the different pieces of legislation. Uh, but that does not give them different priorities. Really want to um, just explore a little bit about self-reporting. Uh, so, you know, that difference between responding to a request and proactively reporting, especially in the context of licensing. Yes, yeah, so uh, that this this isn't uh, a new um, view that, that we've had. Um, so, but it does seem helpful to reiterate it, which is, as you've said, um, responding. Uh, in a timely and complete way to an FMA request for information is good, uh, but it's not self-reporting. Um, self-reporting is when you know the, the the board members that are sitting around the table in, in Sam's conception um, have got uh, a, an issue or something they think should be reported to the to the FMA or not, and the option is theirs that they do so, uh, so that we wouldn't have known about it otherwise. Um, but. Uh, I guess uh, even there um, that self-reporting uh, can be in itself good conduct, but there are times when it does reveal um, that there have been systematic uh, carelessness or, or, something, uh, or something more serious than systematic carelessness about a problem that's gone undetected or, or worse, detected and unchecked uh, for a long time. Um, and so self-reporting um, can be, you know, it's a snow white thing to do, but it can reveal a somewhat um, Mercure iceberg, um, and as uh, as Sam said, um, it, it can show that uh, that the, the self-reporting has come at the end of of the firm exploring every other possible option. We really are um, unfortunately running out of time, but I've probably got time for just one more quick question, and it's in relation to consumer financial decision making. What's more important, performance outcomes or the availability of choice and the ability to exercise choice? Um, Asked I, a hard one last. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, choice choice is, is an outcome, um, but if if the choice is uh, if there's a multiple um, ways to access a poor outcome, I think it would be better than uh, I, I think it's inferior to um, a lesser um, selection of choices to achieve a good one. Um, so, uh, but but obviously um, the, a mixture is best. Uh, to encourage innovation, uh, to encourage different approaches to the same outcome. But if, if we're being forced into a, a binary choice there, then better outcomes is better than more choice. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't managed to actually get through all the questions, but it's testament to just how um, interested and um, you know involved everyone is. So I'd like to thank you both, Claire and Paul, for speaking to us, and we're very grateful for your time and your insights. We wish you well in your new respective roles, uh, and Richard's now going to join us. Um, home te paki paki. <laughs>